It's my pleasure to introduce my guest today, performer and music historian Dr. Giorgio Sanguinetti. Sanguinetti teaches at the University of Rome Tor Vergata. He gives classes and seminars in many prestigious European and American institutions, such as the Orpheus Institute in Ghent, the University of Leuven in Belgium, the Schola Cantorum Basilinius in Switzerland, the NUI in Maynooth, Ireland, the CUNY Graduate Center in New York, Northwestern University, Indiana University in Bloomington, and Boston University. For the winter semester of 2012, he taught at the Schoolish School of Music at McGill University, Montreal. He was the organizer of the 7th European Music Analysis Conference in Rome 2011. He has written several articles and essays on the history of Italian theory from 18th to 20th century, Schenkerian analysis, analysis and performance form in the 18th century music, opera analysis, and has worked intensively in the rediscovery of the Italian part of tradition. In 2012, Oxford University Press published his book, The Art of Partimento, History, Theory, and Practice. In my view, an essential book in your library if you're interested in Partimento. Dr. Sanguinetti is also a moderator on the fast-growing public Facebook group, The Art of Partimento. Dr. Sanguinetti, it's my honor to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you. It was very um Flattering introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Before we dive in, would you be able to tell me a little bit about your musical background? Oh, yes. That's interesting because it has something to do with my interest in Partimenti. I am not a Baroque musician. I was trained as a classical pianist, and uh, I graduated in uh, composition after I quit my performing career. And um, then I... Um, I moved to music theory and analysis, and I spent a wonderful time studying in New York with Karshakter. And um, at that time, it was the early 90s, I think, yes. I was interested in the Schenkerian analysis. And um, so I discovered Partimenti, but this is probably the next the next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's dive into Partimento now. So let me, I've asked quite a few people about this, but can you tell me why did this tradition die out and end up being replaced by the more typical harmony and counterpoint courses that we see in conservatories today? Uh, well, um, this happened because the Italian um, music theory tradition during the 19th century was considered somehow out of date and old fashioned. And, and because of the growing fame and um, growing um, you know, importance of German music theory. So even Italians considered the Partimento tradition something you don't have to, to speak about anymore. I remember when how I discovered Partimento is quite a funny story because it was at the time of my first appointment as an adjunct professor at the University of in Southern Italy in Calabria. And one of my mentors and teachers suggested me, well, why you do, I, I was teaching harmony and counterpoint. So I was thinking about, you know, um, Salzer Schachter and uh, Holdwell and Schachter, Harlan was leading because that was my, I studied this and um, was in New York. And so my, my friend and teacher, Professor Zeno, he told me, why don't you teach Fenerol instead? I mean, this is a joke. Fenerol is something <laughs> so, so old, so old fashioned. So right. I don't didn't even remember who was this Fenerolli guy anymore. Did you know Fenerolli when you were in Italy? Was that a name that people knew? Not really. Maybe some old musicians, you know, old masters. Uh, during the in the seventies, when I when I studied at the conservatory, maybe some old teacher still studied Fenerolli, but was really something old fashioned. I remember when I I, I was studying in the um, conservatory of Milan. The big hit was um, what um, Schoenberg, the harmony era. Schoenberg harmony era was considered the, the modern stuff. In truth, it's not modern at all because it was <laughs> Schoenberg wrote it in 1911. <laughs> but it was That's right. Very, very, very smart thing to do because it was scientific and modern. So yes, no, nobody, nobody really. Maybe someone in Naples, in, in the conservatory of Naples, I, I'm not a Neapolitan, 
and uh, I studied in Milan and uh, in northern Italy. But somehow in the Conservatory of Naples, some old master, they still taught Fenaroli, maybe. That's amazing. So you're saying even in Italy, with the home of where it is, it was starting to fade away. It, it, it faded away a long time ago, I think, oh. because especially, you know, in the after the unification of Italy, Naples lost many, many things and lost importance in the uh, national perspective. So Milan became the modern city and because it had the big theater and Naples also has a big theater, but Milan had the a growing and very powerful publishing uh, industry. You know, Ricordi, uh, all the great music publishers were in Milan. The Conservatory of Milan became the, co- the modern conservatory in Italy. And it was modeled initially after the Conservatoire de Paris. So record, recorded, uh, the, the, the publishing uh, Ricordi, they started to translate into Italian all the modern treatises and uh, handbooks and manuals written for the Conservatoire de Paris. During more or less the 1850 or something like that, the growing influence of German music theory made that uh, Ricordi started to translate from German into Italian some of the most important for the the period, treatises from German school, for example, Richter or uh, Samuel Jadasson, not so much Riemann. Riemann functional harmony didn't really have a grasp in Italian music. Oh, so you're talking about uh, Hugo Riemann, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, Riemann. Okay, well, that's interesting. That it's it's funny that you mentioned that because the Paris Conservatory and this absolutely blew my mind. Would you say it was heavily influenced when it was founded by this Italian parlamentary tradition? Uh, yes, in Paris they had a, a very strong influence from uh, Naples. I mean, per, the Paris Conservatory was in some way modeled after the ancient Neapolitan conservatories, but. In turn, he it influenced the Conservatory of Milan, who became the most modern conservatory in Italy. It's almost like a circle. You know? It's <laughs> a circle, yes. Exactly. <laughs> when you consider the Prix de Rome, so why did the French feel like traveling to Italy was a grand prize for a competition-winning student? Um, the Prix de Rome uh, was really intended for art, uh, for young artists, uh, painters, sculptors, um, musicians came later. And actually, Rome was probably not such an a, a exciting city for young musicians at the times of Debussy, uh, who seems to be quite bored of his <laughs> period. <laughs> <laughs> because Paris was much better. Right, you know. right. <laughs> so can we pinpoint, so you're saying about the middle of the 19th century, that's when Partimento started to get replaced by the more quote-unquote modern uh, sensibilities? Uh, well, this is a very interesting uh, document uh, coming from a um, academy of music theory that existed in Florence in about the middle of the uh, 19th century. And it, the Florentine Academy was led by an amazing figure of musician, music theorist, musicologist. It was Abramo Basevi. You probably you probably know his name because he wrote a very important book on the analysis. Probably the first book, without probably the first book on the analysis of Verdi's operas. And Basevi was an amazing man. I was interested in lot of things. He was a music theorist. He wrote two treatises on harmony, and it was a blowing mind, really. And he established an academy of music theory in Florence. So something that doesn't exist, not yet. I, I don't, mm. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but it in Florence. And uh, one of the... They, they gathered um, about every month or something like that and they had some question to answer and one of these questions was would it is better to study harmony or counterpoint 
like the ancient Italians did, so starting from practice? Or would it be better to study like Germans today do? So they start from theory. So theory or practice first. And this is very interesting because the answer pointed out that the Napolitan system was unbelievably efficient, even though nobody really knew how it worked. Because the Neapolitan master tended to, to keep everything secret. So they say uh, they wrote very little, they wrote just exercises, and they probably knew a lot about the theory of harmony, but they didn't wrote anything about the theory of harmony. So it's just a, a sort of secret knowledge, esoteric knowledge that passed through generation and to direct teaching. Well, you, it's been, that's right, you know, it's been mentioned that this tradition, it was an oral tradition, and much of that living tradition was lost because we don't have the living masters alive today who transmitted that information. But let me ask you this, isn't it also true that there is plenty of archival material available in these Naples Conservatory libraries, but they're kind of, they're part of Menti manuscripts, is that right? Oh, yes. The Neapolitan Library has still has a, a, an unbelievable amount of manuscript material. But uh, what I want to point out that this material are just the exercises. So nothing written. You 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 cannot find a treatise uh, that tells you. Oh, you know, you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. The only rules uh, they call that the rules or regulate. But they only concern the uh, realization of unfigured bases. Uh, so when you have a baseline and you don't have figures, so you have to find out the chords. Uh, so they invented a system that y you could imagine the chord you have to place on this base note. But that's all. But okay, it would be fine had the partimenti been only on figure basis, but more advanced partimenti, they are not on figure basis, uh, but only on figure basis. I mean, they are partimenti changing clef. Yeah, oh, that's right. Seven clefs. Some change all seven clefs. And uh, and you have partimenti when you had to add, when you have to add a baseline beneath a, a, a top line. So it's unbelievably um, intricate. Uh, but you don't have any rule, any written explanation, nothing. You are just to, uh, as I try to do in my book, to figure out <laughs> what, what we have <laughs> to do with this kind of secret uh, knowledge. Do we have Italians alive today, like old masters who know this, or is it like extinct? Uh, I'd say that uh, it is extinct. Um, as is extinct in the way it was practiced in the 18th century, because uh, partimenti continued to be used even in the beginning of the 20th century, they still printed Fenaroli. But the fact is that the two, uh, the real importance of partimenti is that you had to play them, not to write them. So toward the end of the 19th century, the realization of partimenti became a written skill. So you have this baseline and you write the realization. But in the 18th century, you, you didn't have to write the realization, but to play it on the keyboard. And this changes everything because it gives you... A, a fluency and a rapidity and an extensive reaction. I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure you are a you are a player. You are you're an instrumentalist. I'm sure. So you know that when you play your instrument, you don't have to think, oh, now I have to put my finger here and <laughs> then right. my finger here. You, it is a matter of instinct. So composition in the 18th century for someone who was grew, who grew up uh, in the Neapolitan school uh, and elsewhere uh, as well, it was a matter of instinct. 
Now, I've, are you, are we know that they spent 10 years from a very young age, and then yeah. they, they really grew, like you said, in fluency. Now, can we actually break up those 10 years? I know that it said that you have to sing first for three years before you can even touch an instrument. So in those remaining seven years, how would the, was, I know fugues are right at the end, but how would they progress? What was the natural progression for a partimento training? Um, I'm afraid we don't know enough to answer completely this question. As an educated guest, I'd say that they started singing, that's right, because one of the rules of the Neapolitan Conservatory was if you can't sing, you can play. So they started singing and they studied Partimento probably at the same time with counterpoint. So they are two phases of the same thing. With Partimento, you gain the fluency, the rapidity. Uh, with written counterpoint, you learn a more sophisticated way to lead uh, to voices. So avoiding parallel octave, for example, which are very common in Partimento playing. You know, very often you play parallel octaves, and they didn't care much about this. But they did care when you wrote down uh, the um, counterpoint exercises. Problem with counterpoint exercises is that paper was quite expensive. So they used instead what they call a cartelle. And cartelle were a pad uh, of litter, made with litter. So they canceled. Uh, the, um, they wrote down the exercises in this cartel, in this pad, and after that they cancelled it and wrote it again. So uh, what we have is, we have some counterpoint exercises, but not very much, no, not really, not really much. And one, one other interesting thing is that they, oh yes, and they had to, comp- to do what we call the free composition, so is that like fantasias and and that sort of thing? And not really. Mo, mo, most often, that was sacred music. The real business in the Neapolitan Conservatory was sacred music because also a lot of churches, and uh, so they mostly composed um, sacred music. And this is why counterpoint was so important because they had to write fugues in a very very clever way. And the other thing was solfeggio. So solfeggio was not a solfege we intend today, but was a written exercises for voice and continuo uh, without words. So think at an aria without words. And solfeggio were used to teach singers and also as the first the first step toward free composition. So I imagine that the student uh, or Filiolo, when he entered that 10 years age in the conservatory, they started, they started singing, then they started with Partimento, then the counterpoint, then the first attempt for to free composition were solfeggi. And, and then they moved to more complex and more sophisticated composition that mainly was sacred music. Uh, the relationship between the conservatories and the opera house was quite complicated because the opera house always wanted the student of the conservatory to to come and study and, and perform in the opera house, but the the governors of the conservatory were afraid that you know meeting the, all that young women in the opera house that could in some way disrupt the, the, <laughs> the discipline in the conservatory. <laughs> happy (laughs) okay do we have marked exam papers how do we know that they conducted tests or exams do we have like uh, papers with failing grades passing grades in these conservatories yes we have the 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 most important exam in the conservatory was the the promotion from young student to assistant student or graduate student so um, in, in Naples, it was called Mastricello, that means little, young master. The, so they had some kind of pyramid, and at the top was the, the great maestro, like Durante or Leo. Uh, the, the great maestro didn't teach to children. They, he only taught to great students, so to advanced students. In turn, advanced students 
they taught small children. But you have to pass an exam to become a master cello, young master. And we have, we, we have some of the um, written proofs, the written exam. I think that Bob Gerdingen wrote a wonderful paper on the um, counterpoint exam made by a famous composer, Gaspar Spontini, uh, was rejected, by the way. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't pass. He didn't pass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, and can we look at that exam? Did it look tough? What What was the exam look like? Oh, uh, Fuchs. He made he made a small mistake in the answer of the subject. That was that was a terrible mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so were all the teachers in these conservatories? And there was not just one. There was something like four, right? Uh, well, uh, the the, fir- the first teacher was the the most important. This like a dean or the press director of the department. He taught composition or. Uh, counterpoint for sure counterpoint and uh, the most advanced stuff then was a, a teacher for partimento and then a teacher for singing the lowest rank was teacher of um, instruments especially uh, brass instruments you know uh, wind instrument they were not very considered were all the teachers in these conservatories unified in their understanding of this method? In your book, you note several different variations to cadences and the rule of the octave. So were they all different in slight variations? I think that the variation um, depends uh, on the period, on the age of the teacher. Because, you know, the, the, during the 18th century, very often the the same teacher could teach in different conservatories. So I, I'm not sure that there was a specificity of one of the four conservatory versus the other conservatory because the 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 teacher they they very often they change or or took two or three different positions at the same time, and obviously they taught the same time. So probably it's a matter of time. So the, 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 the Fenerali rule of the octave is different from the Durante rule of the octave because Durante was the teacher of Fenerali, and uh, it was a generation earlier. So in different generation, they devised probably different rules of the octave. And then there were some very fancy rule of the octave written by a different composer. For example, this is a totally crazy rule of the octave <laughs> uh, written by in a manuscript by Niccolo Porpora. And this is a single, single uh, the, um, manuscript of Partimenti by Porpora was discovered in the that was discovered in the Library of the Conservatory of Milan. Oh, by the way, and the Conservatory of Milan has one of the greatest collection of Neapolitan Partimenti. Um, beside Naples. And you mentioned Nicola Papora. He's Joseph Haydn's main teacher, actually, and he, he's a pure Neapolitan master. Did Haydn probably get the pure Partimento treatment? Uh, probably. I mean, Haydn was, um, there was a famous letter of Haydn, his autobiography, and he wrote in this letter that he learned everything about music, or some of the most important things he learned about music were taught by um, Maestro Porpora in Vienna. Uh, Haydn was a, a sort of valet of Porpora, and he, he played the harpsichord during Porpora um, singing lessons. And Porpora was a student of Gaetano Greco, who was one of the, the most important uh, first generation Partimento. Uh, so, I mean, I, I will be surprised to, to learn that Haydn didn't know why to think about Partimenti because... Okay, I'm curious about Bologna now, because Bologna, we have Giovanni Battista Martini, also known as Padre Martini, very famous. He taught, like, J, uh, Johann Christian Bach, the son of Johann Sebastian Bach. Leopold Mozart, Mozart's father, consulted with him for his son Wolfgang's training. Bologna has produced some pretty big names, uh, like Rossini, Verdi, Respighi, oh, yeah. Donizetti. So how was Bologna different from Naples in music education? Uh, well, um, we have only one manuscript of Partimenti with the name of Martini. 
and uh, it's not in the li- main library of Bologna, but uh, it is in uh, in the library of Modena, the Libreria Stenza, Biblioteca Stenza in Modena. And um, this is just one example. But of course, the main bulk of, of Bolognese Partimenti are those by Martini students, Padre uh, Mattei. Padre Mattei who published a lot of very interesting Partimenti. And uh, Mattei was the teacher of Donizetti and Rossini, but not of Verdi, who was a Neapolitan as formation. And there was a, a, a big there's a big difference between the Neapolitan and the Bolognese tradition. First of all, uh, most of, or almost all, as far as I remember, Bolognese partimenti are fully um, figured, like German partimenti, for example. And so, mm-hmm. what, what the, and uh, the tradition of Neapolitan partimenti is to figure as little as they can. Bolognese are totally figured, and there are some kind of um, progression they don't use much. And uh, in general speaking, yeah, the style is quite different. And now a few words on Jean-Philippe Rameau, who's arguably known for his theories on fundamental base. Now, did he have an influence on the Neapolitan conservatories? I know Partimenti and fundamental base are they're, they're different, but did, did that seep in some way, much like the German tradition seeped in in the mid-19th century? Uh, of course, Rameau was uh, enormously influential, and uh, he had a great name also in Naples. But his influence arrived quite lately. So I'd say at the beginning of the 19th century, we we have some mention of the name of Rameau or the theory, the fundamental base in some Neapolitan Partimenti collection. But I have the idea that for example, Trito. I have the idea that they mention Rameau just for a matter of duty. So they felt compelled to mention okay. Rameau. Okay. But they were not really so interested, interested in, in Rameau, or they had difficulty to complement the Partimento with Rameau fundamental bass or inversion theory. They did in some way. But they made some very funny things. For example, uh, they considered that there was a, a, an interesting uh, theory, uh, Selvaggi, Gaspar Selvaggi, I think, that was the name, who wrote a treatise on harmony and he applied the theory of chordal inversion, but to the rule of the octave. So the <laughs> chord of the rule of the octave were considered a fundamental position, and they version of the chord were considered inversion. So, for example, on the second degree of the rule of the octave, you have three, four, six chord, and this is a fundamental chord. And then the triad, what we called in root position, was considered an inversion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, can I ask you a question about the rule of the octave and fundamental chord? So, um, you know, now and today we we learn about triads, and you know every uh, bass note in the in the key has a specific triad. How is the rule of the octave different uh, from fundamental chords? Or well, enormously different. One thing is that Neapolitan they never consider a single chord as material of music. They always consider it at least uh, a succession or a progression of three chords. So the simplest harmonic entity in the Neapolitan theory is the cadenza semplice, which is made by a opening tonic, a middle dominant, and a closing tonic. Then from, from here they progressed forward to more complicated cadences, and the arrival point is the real the octave. The real the octave as is the the real the paradigm of tonality for um, the partimento theory, and right. and there's nothing to do with triads. So is um, I mean w- what I want to say is that they never never wrote or considered the single chord as a significant entity in in tonal music, but always at least a succession of three chords, and it doesn't matter if they are triad or they are not triad, it is the same. They were considered, they said consonante, but what is funny is that 
for them consonancy or are not consonances, but they are the court of the rule of the octave. So in the rule of the octave, you, you, you have also very dissonant chord, for example, the two, four, six chord. Well, they are consonances because they are part of the most important paradigm of tonal music. I, it's a completely different uh, perspective. You have uncovered some actual realizations of Partimenti. How rare are these realizations, and what conclusions should we draw from them? They are st- rare, even though in the, um, the few two or three years, some more has been discovered. When I wrote my book, in uh, was based. Uh, I published it in 2012, and my research was concluded about 2010. So it is updated up to 2010. And there were only two original realizations to sh- for sure belonging to the 18th century. Both of them f- of Durante Partimenti. And one is it in Rome, in the, in the Library of Archaeology and the History of Art in Rome. And one is the, in the monastery of Grotta Ferrata <clears throat> near to Rome. The difference is, well, uh, they look more like um, a very flamboyant and virtuoso um, harpsichord sonata by Scarlatti than to a Bach chorale. They are virtuoso pieces, so it, it does nothing to do with what we think about a figure bass. You know, when, when we at school, when we realize a figure bass and four voices with just chords and they keep the chords moving very smoothly. They're nothing like that. They are virtuoso pieces. <laughs> so I, I guess that, yes, that they, for the evidence we have, the, um, the aspect of virtuoso writing, of um, diminution of, I, I, I don't remember the name of it, but the, the, the fact that the, the instrumental, the instrumental style was very important. Speaking of diminution, do we have some we have some examples of diminution exercises, but is that traditionally an oral way of disseminating it to students? How is a student supposed to learn diminution? Uh, yes, I think that they did this in two ways. Uh, one is the, the way they learned the uh, counterpoint. We have some uh, notebooks of counterpoint exercises, and one is by a Verdi's teacher, Vincenzo Lavinia, and is currently housed in the Library of the Conservatory of Milan. So they started with pages and pages and pages of diminution on the uh, cadenza, so on uh, you know opening tonic, middle dominant and closing tonic, and they started in two voices, first with whole notes, then when half notes, then quarter note, and then writing more elaborated diminution. Then they did the same thing in two, in three voices, then in four voices. So uh, diminution was, a, was taught in counterpoint and also in partimento. Think, for example, the so-called um, figurati partimenti of Durante. So Durante gives you the unfigure base and then two or three or maybe four example of diminution. So you, he, he tells you, well, you can use this, this style, he use the word style, not diminution, this diminution, or this, or this, or this, and then you have to, uh, to continue. Uh, I think that diminution is extremely important thing for, for uh, partimento playing because it has a a great importance, could have a great importance for today performance. And for the, this is another, this is another uh, important topic. So uh, the portal of Partimento in the current musical life and the current musical teaching. You also mentioned another important thing, which is imitation. And so how is imitation important in the Partimento tradition? Oh, very. The, the arrival point of Partimento course was fugue. So obviously you had to learn imitation before attempting to, to, to improvise a fugue on a partimento. Partimenti could be written, unwritten, just guessed. And um, so one of the most important 
thing about partiment about imitation in partimento is the way you have to recognize or identify two base segments and uh, uh, that are in the relationship of double or invertible counterpoint. So you have this baseline and you have a, a, a theme, let's call it theme or a, a you know, a melody of uh, two, three or four bars, and then you have a different uh, melody. So at a certain point, at the beginning, you, you don't realize that there are um, something special in those melodies, but when you're experienced, you, real, you, you start to realize that the two melodies can be superimposed, so they're in counterpoint relation. And very often, they... Well, one of the melody is fast moving and uh, interesting, and the other melody is slow moving and uh, not so interesting. So you, what you have to do is put the interesting thing on the um, not so interesting thing and vice versa. And um, you, you don't need to have something, some special sign, like saying, oh, you know, this is an imitation here. No, you have to find out yourself. Let's actually now talk about pedagogy. I'm really interested in your thoughts on how we can take this really important information and change music education. So uh, let's say if I were a parent and I had a kid who was not exposed to, and I could start fresh with Partimento, uh, how would you start to plot that journey for that child's music education? Well, starting from uh, the, the easiest Partimento, of course, uh, the cadences, or cadence, and then start with the rule of the octave, and uh, then move to the bass motion, the regular bass motion, sequences or not sequences, and, uh, and moving slowly, and playing instead of writing. So this is important. So it's not a written exercise, it's, it's, a, it's performance, it's improvisation. And um, of course, this is quite easy if you have a keyboard student. The, it is difficult when you have a, a non-keyboard student. I mean, guitar is okay, but I had to teach a partimento to to drummers. And <laughs> I, <laughs> not easy at all. But uh, but teaching Partimento is, is not so uncommon today. You know, there many, are many conservatories, many colleges, many music schools that, that teach Partimento now. So it's, uh, it's not so, so uncommon. And I think that will be, be more common in the years to come. And uh, when, I, I mean, my book is quite um, scholarly, I know, uh, but now there are uh, this job Gizerman book, which is more apt to to um, current teaching, and uh, I, I think that more books will come out in the in the future. So it's going to become a more common way, and you can teach a lot of things, a lot of things with partimento, not just uh, harmony or counterpoint, but also I insist on on, on a thing that partimento should not be uh, confined to early music player. So uh, it's obvious that a, a harpsichord player with a, a sound uh, education in tarot bass can play partimenti, but say yes, this is obvious. But I think that partimenti can be extremely useful for classical pianists, for romantic pianists, you know, what, what, what they, for the piano player called the black pianist, so because it's the instrument is black. And um, because because of the um, constraint of the work of art regime, so you, you can play a music written and you can change a single note in a Beethoven piano sonata or in a Mozart piano sonata because you are guilty of some horrible uh, <laughs> so you, you don't have to change anything. And this is good, of course, because you, we, we gain the uh, respect for text, which is extremely important. But the, the flip side of the coin is that most classical uh, performers are just stuck and terrifying to do anything that is not written or memorized. And um, this could be a problem, I think, but not because they have to play Beethoven piano sonata with some word fancy uh, no embellishment, but because you can 
you miss the, the fluency of speaking the language. Well, didn't Beethoven, wasn't he a subscriber to a famous uh, compendium of treatises that, that, were, that basically were a summation of Italian treatises? He was a subscriber, um, but there's some discussion about it. You, may, you, you, you mean Sharon, um, the three volumes, Sharon, three volumes. That's right. Yes, he was one of the subscribers, but the book was never found in his library or in any document concerning his library. So someone thinks that he really didn't own the book. But I think that he gave the permission to, to write his name in the... Uh, in the list of subscribers. Anyway, he, he was obviously a great improviser and probably know about Partimenti because he, uh, in Vienna, you know, it, uh, Partimenti were quite common. And um, yes. and in addition, there's the problem of that great number, I mean, a fair, fair number of um, 18th century music is written in an incomplete notation. So it's not fully written. Yeah. Think of a Handel, a Harpsichord Suite, or even Mozart piano concertos. You know, the, 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 the concerto Mozart wrote for himself, you not know, for some other pianist, uh, and the, the piano part is very sketchy, and it needs to be completed. Um, so we know this since, I mean, one century. But the problem that, the problem that you, you don't know what, how to do it, because if, if, what you, if you do it, if, if what you can do is just to play some scales or some chromatic scale or some embellishment, well, so keep the, keep the music as it's written because it's better. But if you can do something more interesting, well, it's worth trying, I'd say. So and how can you learn diminution? So the, the, this kind of diminution that you can apply even to some Mozart music, I think it's through Partimenti. Now, you mentioned that nowadays a lot of schools have started to teach Partimento, and I'm sure a lot of people consult you about learning Partimento. What are some common mistakes you find when someone is trying to learn Partimento? One common mistake is that they want to jump. I mean, the more gifted musician, they try to jump to the third phase of the realization without thinking very well on the first phase. Um, I, I try to explain myself and, better. Uh, very quickly, what are the three, what are the phases? Yes, Finneroli mentioned two phases. One is with simple consonances. It means by simple consonances, I mean when you have a party made in front of you, the first thing you have to do is to figure out what the, uh, the basic harmony structure is. So just play the chords, just try to figure out what the basic chords are. And secondly, you have to add, Fenerolli said, you have to add the dissonances. And by dissonances, Fenerolli means the suspensions. And um, because it was the only kind of dissonance they recognized. The passing and neighboring note were part of diminution. A student of Fenerolli, um, Guarnaccia, added a third stage and the third stage was diminution and imitation. So I think that this is a very wise way to realize Partimenti. So first of all, you have to think about the, the chordal structure, and then you have to add the uh, suspension, when it is the case, and diminution and imitation. So this is the, the, the thing you have to do. Um, I'm discovering now that I'm preparing a master class in uh, Isbarano, which will take place in, in northern Italy, will take place in two days. And so I'm working about the material I, I'm, I'm giving them to my students, and I'm still discovering that the, the, the kind of uh, diminution you want to choose may influence the structure. Uh, so that is thing that I, I discovered quite recently. So it's not entirely true that the diminution is the last stage, and uh, it is some kind of you know of um, something added above. But the choice of diminution may also influence the structure. Uh, this is an interesting thing that I need to work out a little more. A little bit more. Now, your book was released in 2012. Uh, since it's now 2019, what new things have you discovered since your book has been released? 
owe a lot of things, a lot of things. One of the most important thing is that at a certain, in my book, I wrote based on the evidence I had that the possible origin of Partimento was in Rome, because at that time, the, more, uh, the, the oldest surviving um, Partimento collection with the name of the author and more or less a date were those by Bernardo Pasquini and Pasquini. So I tried to reconstruct the story of Pasquini working in Rome at the court of the Queen Christina of Sweden. And uh, in this uh, fantastic um, environment, a very exciting uh, place when he, he worked together with uh, uh, Arcangelo Corelli and with Alessandro Scarlatti and with young Handel. So they, they devised this very sophisticated and highly professional notational system. So f just for insiders. And uh, after that, the young Alessandro Scarlatti, when he moved to Naples, because he, he accepted the position of teaching in Naples, he thought that maybe this um, new kind of style of notation could be used for, for teaching too. A few years later, a manuscript came out in the Library of Paris of an uh, amazing series of partimenti written by a Neapolitan composer, Francesco Mancini, and with a date, and the date is 1669. So we have now the evidence that partimenti existed in Naples before Rome, and, uh, and still counting, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and, Another very amazing discovery was that the the output of Partimenti of Alessandro Scarlatti was limited to two or three uh, dozens, I think, and scattered in different manuscripts. And after my book came out, a huge manuscript was found in the library of Hamburg in northern Germany, and was some 300 Partimenti by Scarlatti. And that uh, they are not obviously, uh, I don't speak about them. No, a lot of things came out, and uh, now I'm working at a re not a revised edition, but a corrected edition, because there are some mistakes in my in 2012 edition, and but with a new preface, and uh, the new preface I will account for all this new discovery, and the book will be a, a paperback, so less expensive than the original edition. You're a professor of music. You've taught music analysis for a long time. Personally, how have you found, how do you think people should analyze music? Should analyze music? Well, today the, the landscape of music analysis is totally different from the landscape in which I, I grew up. So a formal point of view, uh, now we have the Galant Schemata theory, and which complements very well with Partimento theory. And... And so there are these thoughts, what I mean to, what I mean is that's not a single perspective as it used to be in the 80s or the, or in the 90s of the previous century. But we have to adapt for every piece a different perspective that could point out some, something that is relevant from the point of cultural history. So it's not just uh, reverse engineering of the piece of music. When you analyze a piece of music, you have to say something important about also the cultural history of this music. That's what I'm, I'm doing now. So um, I don't think that music analysis is just a matter of, you know, you, you take a piece of music, you say, oh, this is so and so and so and so. It, does to, it has to be to do with, yes, the cultural history is positioned in the, in the in, in the era in which it was written. Uh, I think that is to complement the musicology with music theory. This is what has been doing now. For, for example, their, their fabulous books came out in the recent, for example, A Mozart Musical Friend by Edward Clorman, and he's doing exactly the thing I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to explain. So music analysis is not for, him, for itself, but for the understanding of a piece of music in, in a larger and in a larger perspective.
I want to ask you about just the place of these important Neapolitan composers. We're very German-centric in the way we think about classical music nowadays. Everybody knows about Mozart. Everybody knows about Bach. Who are some Neapolitan or just Italian composers that really should be on that same level in, in when we talk about great composers? Yes, I think that is Leonardo Leo. Leonardo Leo is one of the most amazing uh, composers, and uh, it was more like the same generation of Bach. And uh, his music is almost totally unknown today, it's still to discover. And uh, it was a, a really an amazing composer. What was so amazing about him? Fabulous counterpoint, great melodic invention, poignancy of expression. He's a great composer. Uh, and a few more. Give me a few more. Oh, well, Alessandro Scarlatti is for one. And uh, Durante was still a great composer. Uh, is, but my, my, my point, when I wrote this book, I thought uh, to the Neapolitan tradition more as a, a global tradition. So not just the name, not just a single composer, but uh, is a uh, over-personal tradition. And um, I, I think, for, in fact, if you want more names, I, I can point out, for example, Gaetano Veneziano or Francesco Provenzale. They're all great musicians, all of them. Well, there's a famous musician, uh, the opera composer Vincenzo Bellini. He was greatly admired by Chopin, Liszt, even Richard Wagner. He's a product of the Neapolitan tradition. I think his first teacher was Furno. Yes, uh, Bellini was he studied and graduated. Uh, from the Conservatory of Naples, and, and uh, he studied with yes, of Furno. He studied with uh, Zingarelli, and uh, and with Trito too, I think. And um, uh, he graduated with an opera, his first opera in, uh, in the in the um, Conservatory of of Naples. And yes, it's a, a totally, pro- but also Verdi. Verdi was totally Neapolitan in his formation. You know that Verdi was refused admission to the Conservatory of Milan. Really? So he, <laughs> he, yes, he applied uh, to to the Conservatory of Milan, and there was an exam, and uh, he, he was refused admission. So he had to study with a private teacher, and his private teacher was Vincenzo Lavinia, who was a student of Fenerovi. So... Uh, Verdi was a proud student of the Neapolitan tradition of Durante, Fenaroli, and he acknowledged that. I mean, he, he was absolutely uh, happy about that. The great Dr. Giorgio Sanguinetti, I mean, I have a final question for you. If you were to put in charge of music education for the world, what reforms would you enact? What sort of things would you emphasize or stress? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I would probably introduce a more practical way of learning music theory and music analysis with hands-on. And so not, not just write down, you know, not Roman numerals or something like that, but try to, to play, to improvise, and to to speak the same language uh, the tonal composers spoke. So, th- yes, I think that this is a, the most important thing uh, I, I can think about. There are many others, of course, but <laughs> this is what, <laughs> since we are speaking about Partimate, I think that, yeah, this is the same thing I will do. Um, and so your, your book, you're releasing a new revised edition. Do you have any other upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Well, I wrote many articles in the meanwhile, and uh, one is on Bellini, and uh, Bellini in Norma borrowed a, a fragment of uh, Beethoven Moonlight Sonatas. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out why he did so and for what reason. I'm currently working at a, a book on Beethoven Piano Sonatas, and um, it is the first volume of a five-volume series published in Italy by the Society of Musicology. And in this book, I try to, it's an introduction to Beethoven Piano Sonata. And I try to to introduce this unbelievably complicated topic from the point of view of a different from genre and form. So why is it so important that we place Beethoven Piano Sonata in, in the right context? and in the 
uh, in the context for for which they have been uh, written, composed, and um, and um, performed. So this is this is my my work, the, the work I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, the great Dr. Giorgio Sanguinetti, what a treat it's been to be able to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise on this very important subject. To my audience, you simply must buy his fantastic book, The Art of Partimento by Oxford University Press. Dr. Sanguinetti, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you to you very much. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 